Glad you're here today. It's good to see you. We'll be in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, beautiful music this morning. It's good to hear you sing. And uh, sometimes I just got to stop and listen to you sing. And uh, it's good that you're here. <clears throat> you know, as I was preparing for uh, the message this morning, and I'll say that if you were in Tim's Sunday school class this morning, some of this will parallel. And uh, tonight's uh, message will as well, and it's almost like somebody else is in charge of all this, right? You know, lining all this stuff up, because I promised you Tim and I didn't talk uh, before today, uh, but James chapter 1 is where we'll be, and as I was thinking about the, the message that we'll look at this morning, it couldn't help but draw my mind uh, back to the year 2009 and 2010 when I had the opportunity to go through a program they call Leadership Magnolia. And uh, Angela was in the class with me. That's where I met Angela Sherman for the first time. Of course, uh, we graduated from Leadership Magnolia in early 2010, and then uh, it was sometime there soon after that I came here for the very first time and, and uh, filled the pulpit, and then later came as associate pastor. But uh, that was a great experience going through that program. One of the very first things we did, I think they've changed it a little bit now, but we went to the Arkansas 4-H Center, wherever that is. I don't remember, but you may know where it is. But we went there for a weekend of team building, okay? We're supposed to grow together as a class, do those sorts of things. And for some unknown reason, apparently high ropes courses are a wonderful way to do team building, okay? And so um, you get to the end of the high ropes course, and there was a zip line that would take you to the bottom in a rat or rapid pace, okay? Now, if you know much about me at all, you might know that I have an eight-foot ladder at home. And if I can't reach it from that eight-foot ladder, I'm not going to reach it. I'm not going to walk around on your roof, no matter how stable it might look. If something happens on my roof, I will pay somebody to come over. Okay, I've hired Miranda's boys to come clean the gutters out on the back of my house in Magnolia because that was so far up there I couldn't reach them, okay? I will pay somebody. I'm not doing heights. But I'm looking at this high ropes course. I said, you know, I don't know. I don't really think that's for me. But the zip line, I have to admit, it looked fun. And there was a big part of me that really wanted to do the zip line. But I had concerns, had a lot of questions from talking to the person who worked there and who was leading our group, and he, I explained to him my concerns with the high ropes course, that I didn't do heights. I won't say I'm scared of heights. I'm deathly afraid of heights, okay? I'm just not going. Maybe my center of gravity is too high. I don't know. But he said, well, you don't have to do the whole high ropes course. You see, you can just get to that top, climb the ladder, get on the platform, a short little swinging bridge over will take you directly to the zip line, and you can do it. So I started asking him even more questions. Like, are you sure this harness will hold me if I slip? Well, it's supposed to. <laughs> What's the weight limit on that bridge? Well, he didn't know. I said, am I going to die if I fall? He said, I can't tell you that. I'm not allowed to answer that question, but I can tell you nobody ever has. But I can't promise you won't. So all this is going through my mind as I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do. And I said, you know what? I'm looking at that bridge. I've seen a couple people go over it so far, and I said, I think I can do it. So I got the harness on, and I started up that four or 500-foot ladder, it appeared. I, you know, it wasn't over 25, 30 feet probably, you know, but it looked really big to me at the time. And I start up that ladder, and I get all the way to the top of the ladder, and I put my first foot on that wood platform at the top. I don't know who snuck up there and tied my other foot to that ladder, but it seemed no matter how hard I pulled that foot, it wasn't coming. It was as if something was telling me, no, you don't need to be up there. And so after struggling with that foot for just a few seconds, seemed like an eternity, probably wasn't more than five seconds, I just went back down the ladder. <laughs> I said, I'm just not going to do it, you know. I, just, I volunteered to be the spotter from the ground, 
you had to have a safety man, and I volunteered for that position. You know, it didn't matter how safe that guy told me it was. Well, he never could really tell me it was safe. He just told me, I didn't want to mess up their statistics, okay? No matter how badly I wanted to enjoy that zip line, no matter how much I wanted to get the thrill of just flying through the air as we went down to the ground, a little bit of doubt crept in my mind. And just that little bit of doubt, what if the harness doesn't hold? What if the bridge breaks? Of course, if the bridge breaks, the harness is supposed to catch you, but what if the harness breaks, right? What if something happens? That little bitty bit of really unrealistic doubt stole all the joy I would have received from going down that zip line. You ever struggle with doubt, with trusting? Maybe something's happened and you say, you know, I'm just a skeptical person. You know, we really ought to have uh, uh, towards a lot of things, as we approach a lot of areas of life, we ought to have a certain amount of caution. We ought to approach some areas of life with a certain amount of skepticism, right? But the Bible's very clear about one area of life where we're to have <clears throat> no doubt at all, where we're to be 100% certain, where we should never let doubt creep in. James addresses that here in James chapter 1, but I think about other verses that you know like Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings, and in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your paths. I think about Proverbs 29, 25, which says, The fear of man brings a snare, brings a trap. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. And I think one of the most beautiful verses on this subject is Isaiah 26, 3, that says, You will keep Him in perfect Peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Perfect peace from trusting in God. What a beautiful picture and what a beautiful promise. And no matter what we face in life, the Bible is abundantly clear that we ought to trust God to get us through. That's the message we'll find in our text this morning. And I just want to tell you that I want to give you a lot of encouragement this morning, all right? A lot of encouragement. When you face trials in life, we ought to trust God to see us through. But here's the thing. Here's where I want to encourage you. If you're not in the middle of a trial right now, you're going to be, right? Say so a lot of encouragement you are. It's just the truth. And we ought to recognize that, and we see the promises here in God's Word to get us through. Read with me James chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that of all the places we could be and of all the excuses we could use, the rain, anything else, to not be here this morning, I thank you that we're here. I thank you. Uh, that we're here to study your word, and I do thank you for the rain. And Father, I pray right now that you'd help us to set aside everything else that we're thinking about. Help us to set aside all the distractions. Help us to focus completely and totally on you. Lord, you've got a message for every person in this room today, and I pray that you'd help us all to receive that message you have for us. I pray that you'd continue to give me the words to speak as I stand here this morning. They'd be your words and not mine. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get to the main point of the text this morning, I want to show you just a couple of things. First of all, I want to just point out the fact we're going to be in the last half of what we read this morning. If you want the 
introductory part of it. You've got to come back tonight to get the rest of it. We're going to look at some of the first half of it uh, tonight, but I want to show you a couple of things from that first part to get us into the second part. Look at verse 2. He starts out with two very important words, my brethren. Now, if you were in Sunday school this morning, you got a little dose of this. Who is James talking about when he says, my brethren? Who is this letter written to? Saved people. That's who he's written to. He's, that's, who, that's who he's writing to. He's writing to people who have already trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Let's not skip over this. This is important because you need to know this morning, if you're here and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, what, let me just stop and say, there's going to be some big encouraging points here we're going to get to in a minute. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it doesn't apply to you. James was writing to saved people. But there's hope for you this morning because 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if you heard me preach very much, you know one of my favorite verses is Romans 10, 13 that says, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're sitting here this morning and you can hear my voice, I want you to know that you're a whosoever. And if you'll call on the name of the Lord, he says he'll save you. And then everything else we're about to talk about this morning will apply to you as well. But one more thing before we get to verse 5, which is where we're going to really focus this morning in verses 5 through 8, I want to just give you a little synopsis of verses 2 through 4. Read that again. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. For the purposes of the sermon this morning, I just want you to know this quick summary. Here's what James is saying. How we respond to life's problems will reveal the depth of our fellowship with God. And the deeper our fellowship with God, the more joy we'll experience in life. There'll be trials There'll be troubles. Those things will come our way, but the closer we are to God, the more joy we have even in the midst of trials and suffering. He says that our life's problems ought to drive the saved person closer to God where we'll experience more joy. But we're going to focus now for the next few minutes on verses 5 through 8, so let's read those one more time. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, then I'll stop for a second. What do you mean wisdom? What kind of wisdom? Wisdom about what? Now, I hear this all the time. Somebody will say, well, you know, the Bible says if you just ask God for wisdom, he'll give it to you. And that's true. That's what the Bible says. James is talking about a specific type of wisdom. And it refers back to those earlier verses. That's why we looked at those real quick. If any of you lacks wisdom about how to deal with life's problems, if any of you are facing a trial, and you don't know what to do. You lack the wisdom to know how to respond. Ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The first thing I want you to see here from the text this morning is that God doesn't expect us to have all the answers. Now, isn't that like a weight lifted off our shoulders? If you're facing a difficulty in life, if you're facing a, a hardship in life, we can be talking about a physical difficulty, a health diagnosis. We could be talking about a, a spiritual difficulty. We could be talking about an emotional difficulty. We could be talking about any type of trial that life throws our way. God doesn't expect us to have all the answers. Because in verse 2, he says, if you lack wisdom, he says, let him ask of God. You ever heard somebody say, well, God will never give you more than you can handle? That's a lie refuted by this verse right here because this is very clear that God will give us more than we can handle so that we can ask him how to handle it. 
So it will deepen our dependence on him. But you know, when I first scratched out my notes on this sermon, I, I read that, you know, let him ask of God. I wrote down, God invites us to ask him for wisdom. Then I realized I was wrong. This is not an invitation. This is a command. This is a direct command and written by James, inspired by God. This, the word uh, or the, the phrase, let him ask, in the Greek is in the imperative verb structure, which means this is not optional. This is what God expects his children to do. He doesn't expect to find the solution on our own. He expects us to depend on him and to ask him. The Christians expected and commanded to seek God's wisdom when dealing with the everyday problems of life and the big things, just like Brother Eric preached on last week. He wants to be part of the little days. He wants to be a part of the big days. He wants to be a part of the little problems. He wants to be a part of the big problems. He doesn't expect to be our last resort. Heard somebody say one time, or I read it on a bumper sticker, or I saw this somewhere. I don't know where I saw it, but it said, when all else fails, pray. You know, that's the way a lot of people live. When all else fails, pray. James says, pray first. That's what we're commanded to do. Ask God. Pray first. He doesn't expect to be the last resort. He doesn't expect to be some temporary patch. You know, that's, why, that's the way some people treat God. They say, well, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to kind of let God handle it until I can figure out how to do it. I heard Adrian Rogers say, God doesn't want to be the spare tire. He wants to be the steering wheel. Too many of us use God like he's the spare tire instead of letting him direct us all through our life. He expects, us, he expects to be our first call. We say, well, what if we don't seek his wisdom? What happens if we just go on and try to do it our own way? I couldn't have said it any better than John MacArthur, so I'll quote to you what he says in his commentary on this. He says the Lord's likely to keep the test active and even intensify the test until his child comes to the throne of grace. Until he makes his ear attentive to wisdom, as Proverbs 2, 2 says. And until he inclines his heart to understanding. And you say, MacArthur can't be right. There's no way a loving God would intensify a problem, would intensify a trial, would intensify a test on one of his own children. Well... What does the book say? In 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, Peter says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more than precious, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, Peter says sometimes, did you catch that phrase? If need be. Sometimes we need some trouble thrown in our life. Sometimes we need some trials in our life. Why? Well, Peter talks about the guy who refines the gold. And how do you refine gold? You put it in the fire, burn off the blemishes. You melt it down and it burns off those impurities and then what's left is pure gold. Sometimes God allows trials in our life. Sometimes he allows testing in our life in an effort to burn off some of those impurities. Why does he do it? Because we need it. Because you and I are, are human beings. We live in a fallen world. And sometimes... We need that to draw us closer to him. It's all Peter says, so that we may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, which brings us full circle back to verse 2 when he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Because falling into those trials ought to cause us to become more refined, which ought to bring us more joy in the Lord. The first thing you need to know is that God doesn't expect us to handle it all on our own. 
To me, that's one of the greatest, greatest lessons that we can learn as followers of Jesus Christ. But I want to point out something else to you. Not only does he command us to ask, he says it matters how you ask. Look at verse 6. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. He puts that with no doubting in there just to verify what faith is. Faith is complete and total trust in God. Complete and total trust in God. You know, so you might say, what is faith? A lot of times we, uh, it's a churchy word and we kind of think we know what it means. And a lot of times we say, well, here's our definition of faith. We take it from Hebrews 11.1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that's true, but it goes right over our head. What in the world does that mean? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Here's what it means. You can trust that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. Or I liked Adrian Rogers' definition of it. He says, faith is believing in God in spite of appearances and obeying God in spite of the consequences. That's faith. Believing God, trusting God, despite what your eyes can see knowing that he is in control. When life's troubles come our way, and again, they will, James says we ought to ask God how to handle it, and we ought to trust that he's going to give us the answer. He says he'll give us that answer liberally, and you say, I don't want nothing liberal. That's what we'd say today. Well, no, no, no. I want this liberally, because that means generously. We have perverted the meaning of that word. He says he'll give it to us generously, without reproach. That means, you know, I mean, I remember, of course, I guess we'll still do this. This is just human nature. A lot of times, if we don't know something in front of certain groups, we don't, we don't want to admit that we don't know it, right? Because then it'll be like, I believe he didn't know that. I mean, how dumb are they that they didn't know that? He says, God's not going to do that to us. We can ask of God, and he's going to do what any loving father would do. You think about going to your father, and you say, Daddy, I don't know how to do this. What's any loving father going to do? He's going to say, here, let let me show you how it's done. Let me teach you how to do this. James says, that's what God does. If we just ask with total faith, Believing that he'll do it. One last thing. Again, he says you got to steer clear of doubt. He says, let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Warren Wearsby says the greatest enemy to answered prayer is unbelief. Now, don't get your philosophy about prayer from 90s country music, okay? There is no such thing as an unanswered prayer, no matter what Garth Brooks says, okay? God answers every prayer of his child. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, sometimes he says wait, you're not ready. But he answers every prayer. And the greatest enemy to answered prayer is unbelief. There's a great danger in doubting God, and James reminds us of that here. And maybe you say, oh, I'd never doubt God. Good, I hope you wouldn't. When we lay our head down at night, we can probably think back through the day and count several times where we doubted God and didn't realize it, where trouble arose, and we just tried to take care of it on our own instead of trusting that he could give us the answer. That's what James was talking about. And the danger is, did you catch what happens when we doubt? He says, let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. So not only will you not receive the answer to your request for wisdom, he says, if you doubt God, he's going to withdraw everything. Let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. Why would God withhold wisdom? Why would God withdraw blessing over just a little bit of doubt? Well, did you see how he described the doubter? First, he said, he's like a wave of the sea. He's driven and tossed by the wind. How do the waves 
move, they move in and out, don't they? They're close to the shore, and they're away from the shore. They're close to the shore, and they're away from the shore. The doubting Christian is close to God, and then he's away from God. He's trusting that God can answer, can give him a response, and then a few minutes later, he's trying to figure out how to fix it on his own. And see, the reason God withdraws from the doubter is because what if his blessing falls during that time they're trying to fix it on their own, and then they get all this confidence, look what I did, and take complete credit for what God did. So doubt just completely withdraws God's assistance. But there's one other thing. Not only is the doubter like a wave, he said in verse 8, he's a double-minded man. He's unstable in all of his ways. This this term double-minded comes from a Greek term, dipsychos. Dipsychos, di, di, meaning two. Psychos, meaning mind. Meaning quite literally, he has two minds. He has one mind that trusts God, and he has one mind that trusts himself. It's like trying to drive a car, and and instead of looking forward, you're going forward. You're supposed to be looking forward, but you're always looking backwards. Guess what? You're going to wreck out. You're never going to get to where you're going. Can you imagine if you could see, if you literally, now some of you mothers do. I don't want the children to think otherwise. Can you imagine if you literally had eyes in the back of your head? Right? I don't know. Maybe if somebody in the room was telling me that they, they had a child that believed that, asked their mother, mother's driving, they asked them a question and said, you know, um, t- trying to show them something, said, well, I can't look, I'm driving. They said, well, can't you look with the eyes in the back of your head? But can you imagine if we really did have eyes in the back of our head? There'd be so much behind us distracting us that we'd never make it to where we're going. That's the problem with doubt. That's the problem. It keeps us distracted. It keeps us from completely trusting God. It means with one mind we seek the way of God, and with the other mind we seek the way of the world. And that's never the way God's people were intended to serve Him. It goes all the way back to to nearly the beginning. If you were to look in the book of Deuteronomy, you know the verse, chapter 6, verse 5. It was God's command to His people Israel. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's the number one verse for the Jewish people. He said, put it on your doorway. Put it around your forehead. Don't you ever forget that. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then, of course, if if you know the Gospels, Jesus repeated that and enhanced it. And in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, uh, Jesus is answering when he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You can't halfway serve God. You're supposed to serve Him with all your mind. You can't halfway trust God. You've got to trust Him with all your mind and with all your heart. Because God gave us all. He gave us all he had when he sent Jesus. You know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I one time read one commentator who said, He didn't just send his only begotten Son, he sent all that heaven had. He didn't send the best that heaven had, he sent all that heaven had so that you and I wouldn't have to spend eternity in hell. Because there's one way to heaven, and that's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He gave us all that he had. Jesus Christ suffered and died on a cross so you and I could go to heaven, and the only thing he asked of us is that we love him and that we serve him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. And he said, oh, and if you'd love your neighbor as yourself, if you do those things, you'll obey every law that's ever been written. A double-minded person can't fulfill the greatest commandment ever given. But worse than that, a double-minded person can't please God and can't receive the blessings of God. 
Therefore, they don't experience the joy of the Lord. May we be people who are not double-minded, who have one focus, and that is on Jesus Christ. You know, I just think back to me and the high ropes. When I allowed doubt to enter into my mind, what it robbed me of, in reality, it, it robbed me of the joy of saying I did this. I conquered that fear. It robbed me of the joy of flying through the air on that zip line. I'd have probably gone down faster than the others, you know. <laughs> Either that or like in a water slide, get stuck halfway around, right? But I don't know where you find yourself this morning. You find yourself doubting God? If you say, you know what, everything was going good, but then I let that little doubt creep in. And when I let that doubt creep in, everything started going downhill. I want you to know there's hope. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, it says, Through the Lord's mercies, we're not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is faithful. There's where the hope is. His mercies are new every morning. He gives us a new chance every single day. If you woke up this morning, and as I look around, all of you at least woke up once. You, some of you may need to nudge your neighbor and wake them up again before we leave. But when you woke up this morning, it was a new chance. When you wake up tomorrow, his mercies are new. And you have the option to decide, am I going to follow him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, or am I going to be this double-minded person who misses out on the blessings of God? We're going to prepare for our invitation and maybe this morning you faced a trial that you hadn't been able to find the solution to. I hope this morning you'll follow the biblical command and you'll ask God for wisdom to get through your trial. Maybe this morning you realize you've been double-minded. You've been trying to fix it on your own. Now's the time to repent and to follow God. Ask him for his wisdom. Now maybe you're not going through any specific trial right now. You will. Set out now to seek God's wisdom to get you through that trial when it comes. I don't know what God's laid on your heart, but let's take care of that as we stand and sing. Number 99.